Amen, amen. Well, good morning, church. So um, thankful for the opportunity for us to gather together in worship this morning. I just also want to remind you at this time that another way that we worship, not just through singing, not just through the give, um, not just through studying God's word together, but we also worship through the giving of our tithes and offerings. So I'd invite you at this time, um, wherever you're watching this, you can go onto our app, onto our website, and you can um, give your tithes and offerings online. You can also mail in your tithes, your offerings to the church. Really look forward to gathering back as a church body, those that are not high risk and those that are comfortable doing so next week, really looking forward um, to that. While we're looking forward to some of those things, you know, we have to be honest as we think about our nation right now and with everything that is going on, I want to take a moment and just pause right now and, and have a time of prayer. We all know about the terrible death of George Floyd up in Minneapolis. I feel like it'd really be appropriate for us uh, to go to the Lord and pray for his family, just pray for our country at this time. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we come before you this morning. Lord, we know that every person is created in your image. And Lord, worthy of dignity. And so God, we grieve this morning with the death of George Floyd. Lord, we understand, Lord, in the hearts of our fellow citizens, fellow brothers and sisters of color, incidents like this or connect to a long history of unequal justice in our country. And so, God, we grieve and we ask, Lord, that you would be at work as we think about those images from Minneapolis. Lord, it reminds us there's a lot of work to be done as we pursue justice. So we ask, Lord, for you to bring justice for you to bring peace. God, we also thank you for those law enforcement officers that put their lives on the line every day, bravely risk their lives. But we also lament those that abuse their position with force, who harm those that they are called to protect. So God, we cry out for justice. Lord, we know that your word lays out for us how we are to love our neighbors, Lord, how are we to protect the vulnerable? Lord, how we are to pursue peace. Lord, we know everyone is created in your image. And so we know, Lord, we can't remain silent when we see injustice. And so, God, we pray that you would be with us. Lord, we pray for peace. Lord, we pray for healing. God, we pray for your spirit to be at work. And Lord, it seems like we've been praying this a lot, but we ask that you would bring beauty from ashes and for you to work. God, we're thankful that we can gather here together and worship. We know that your word says that when, part, when one part of your body grieves, the entirety of the body grieves with it. So we grieve with the Floyd family now. And God, we turn to you to look for hope, to look for help, to look for healing. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. As we look to God's word this morning, we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 13. So Nehemiah chapter 13, we are finally, after this entire spring, we're finally wrapping up Nehemiah this morning. So as you're turning there to Nehemiah 13, there is something that we want to remind you of, and what that reminder is, is kind of what we are going to do next week as we start to gather together, as we want to make sure that we um, keep social distancing and other things like that. And so we have this little video that we've made, four main guidelines that we want to use as a church to remind us 
of how we can come together and worship together and um, be good neighbors as we do so. Fifi Baptist Church family. By now, you've most likely heard, received the letter about how we are going to be regathering together for corporate worship services on June 7th. And I just want you to know that things are going to be a little bit different when we come together again. In the midst of all that, we want the focus to be on Jesus and worshiping and glorifying Him whenever we gather. For this reason, we've developed four simple guidelines to help smooth our transition as we hold services on our campus again. So, in the heart of both love for God and for our neighbor, here are four guidelines as we regather. Number one, extend grace. We know right now people have a lot of opinions on what we should and shouldn't be doing as we navigate through this fan pandemic. Let's extend grace to those that are doing things differently than we might be. Also, let's extend grace to our leadership and be flexible as things might change and look different than we're used to. Second, let's give space. We need to be conscientious about maintaining proper social distancing between family groups. Think of it this way. Six feet is basically two adult arm lengths. Third, allow time. We need time to move people in and out of our building for our services and to clean between services. Please don't come into the building until 15 minutes before the start of the service at the earliest. Also, allow time for ushers to dismiss you at the end of service and leave promptly when it's your turn. Feel free to fellowship once you get outside. And fourth, finally, use wisdom. If you feel sick, stay home. If you've been around someone who's ill, stay home and join us for worship online through our website or via Facebook Live. We recommend wearing a mask and we'll have some available if you need one. We want to use common sense for the common good. To summarize, here are four guidelines as we regather for worship on June 7th. Extend grace, give space, allow time, and use wisdom. We can't wait to worship together on June 7th. Well, I hope those four guidelines will be helpful for us as we want to gather together, look forward eagerly to that, but we also want to make sure that we love our neighbor well. And so really look forward to seeing those of you that feel comfortable worshiping with us next week. Uh, really excited as we do that as we get to kick off our summer by gathering um, together. So would ask for you to continue to keep those guidelines in mind so that we can worship together safely as safely as possible and try to remain comfortable as well. Well, as I said, we're going to be back in Nehemiah 13. And just as a quick little summary, we've been building up to this time. The first half of the book was all about Nehemiah, who was told by God to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. So they go and they build those walls up. They'd been destroyed for 141 years. They build them up in 52 days. It's incredible. Then the latter half of the book, we see that they go from rebuilding the wall to restoring God's people to renewing the covenant. And that all happened. And then last week, we looked at how people moved back into Jerusalem how they got up and they dedicated the wall and they celebrated. They talked about how they were going to support God and His ministry. And everything looked great. If Nehemiah ended at chapter 12, we could all be really happy. However, there's a chapter 13. And it's a little bit of an anticlimactic ending to it all. So we're going to get into that, and I would ask uh, for my friend Kevin to read from Nehemiah chapter 13 this morning. On that day, the book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people. 
And there was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be admitted into the assembly of God, because they had not met the Israelites with food and water, but had hired Balaam to cast the curse down on them. Our God, however, turned the curse into a blessing. When the people heard this law, they excluded from Israel all who were of foreign descent. Before this, Eliashib the priest had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah, and he had provided him with a large room formerly used to store the grain offerings and incense and the temple articles, and also the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil prescribed for the Levites, musicians, and gatekeepers, as well as the contributions for the priests. But while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the thirty-second year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Some time later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about all the evil things El Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased and threw all Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms, and then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them, and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, Why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. All Judah brought the tithes of grain, new wine and olive oil into the storerooms. I put Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and a Levite named Pri Pediah in charge of the storerooms, and made Hanan son of Zakur, son of Mataniah, their assistant, because they were considered trustworthy. They were made responsible for distributing the supplies to their fellow Levites. Remember me for this, my God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its services. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we love you. We are thankful for your word. God, we're reminded that we need to turn to you. God, that we can always depend on you. And Lord, that we need to depend on you because it's so easy to fall away. So God, we pray for the next few moments, Lord, that you'd turn our attention to your word. Lord, that you'd speak to our hearts. And God, we pray. Lord, that we can run the race well that you have set out for us. We love you, Lord. It's in your son's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. So what we really have here in Nehemiah is we have this really anticlimactic ending. Nehemiah, they dedicate the wall. They move people back in the city. They're worshiping God. Everything's going well. So what Nehemiah decides to do, he says, hey, my work is basically done. This is wonderful. I'm going to, it's basically retire. I'm going to go back to Susa where I was born, go back, and it's going to be wonderful. And what most scholars think, there's some, there's some discrepancies. It was anywhere from one year to seven years that Nehemiah was gone. Let's just hope it was seven, okay? Let's hope it was that long. One year to seven years, and he comes back, and things have completely flopped in Jerusalem. You know, it's really interesting. I was doing some reading on the Witness Protection Program. Witness Protection Program. There's this guy. His name was Michael Anthony Drew. Now, Michael Anthony Drew was a St. Louis gangster, okay? He spent time in prison for murder. When he got out of prison, he got in this like drug racketeering thing with his gang, and what happened is he turned state's witness. And so what this convicted murderer got to do is he got a complete fresh start. He turned on his gang, and he was given a new identity, new life, and he was transplanted from St. Louis to Maine. Now, just a few months after Michael Anthony Drew had been moved to Maine, he was arrested 
because he pulled a gun on an FBI informant that he was trying to do a drug deal with. This guy had a fresh start. He had a new life. And just months into it, what did he do? He fell back into his same pattern of living, his same old thing. And what he, that story reminds us, and really as we read through Nehemiah, what it reminds us is we need more than a fresh start, don't we? We need more than just a fresh start. Nehemiah would be great if it ended in chapter 12. They dedicate the wall. They're marching around. They've repopulated Jerusalem. They're so supportive of the worship in the temple. Everything is looking great. And if Nehemiah just ended right there, it'd be wonderful. But Nehemiah doesn't end there. Because what we see in the book of Nehemiah is we see a cycle that happens throughout the entirety of the Old Testament, right? For a season, God's people are faithful and they're following after him. And then they start to fade away and they fall back into sin. Nehemiah goes to retire and he has to come back one to seven years later, something like that, and he has a heartbreaking return to Jerusalem. It's a heartbreaking return. Do you remember how the Israelites made four distinct vows in chapter 10? You know, they wouldn't enter Mary, they would honor the Sabbath, they'd value worshiping together corporately, they'd give generously to support the temple and its ministry. Well, now we see that the Israelites are breaking the very four vows that they made in chapter 10. In verses 23 and 24, listen to this. It says, in those days, I also saw Jews who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half their children spoke the language of Ashdod, of the language of one of the other peoples, but could not speak Hebrew. So they broke the vow about not intermarrying with pagans, because what happened? They'd intermarried with pagans. Then, in verse 15, it says, at that time I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath. They're also bringing in stores of grain and loading them on donkeys along with wine, grapes, and figs. All kinds of goods were being brought to Jerusalem on that Sabbath day. So I warned them against selling food on that day. They dishonor the Sabbath. Verse 10, I also found out because portions from the Levites had not been given, each of the Levites and the singers performing their services had gone back to his own field. The people working in the temple to hold services had gone. So we see that they aren't valuing corporate worship. Then we see that the storehouse, verse 4 and 5, Five. Now before this, the priest, Eliashib, had been part, put in charge of the storerooms of the house of God. Instead of being filled with tithes, with offerings, he was a relative to Tobiah, and he prepared a large room for him where they had previously stored the grain offerings, the frankincense, the articles, the tents of grain, the new wine, the fresh oil. So they aren't giving generously anymore. Instead of this whole storeroom full of things to be used to worship God, they let a pagan move into this room. So what does Nehemiah do? Nehemiah drives some of these men out. He clears the temple. He drives out some of the merchants and what's really interesting is it says that he actually goes and he pulls out the hair of some of the offenders. I guess I'm good, right? <laughs> That's an interesting bit of church discipline, right? To go and pull people's hair out, but it just shows his anger. It must have been heartbreaking for Nehemiah. He was a great leader. But he disappears, rides off into the sunset, and comes back to utter chaos. 
So Nehemiah does dole out discipline. But what else does he do? Three different times in this chapter, we see Nehemiah do something. You know what he does? We see him pray. Look at verse 14. Remember me for this, my God. Don't erase the deeds of faithful love I've done for the house of my God and for its services. Verse 29. Remember them, my God, for defiling the priesthood as well as the covenant of the priesthood of the Levites. Verse 31. Remember me, my God, with favor. You see, I think we have two options when it comes to how we go about living our lives. And those two options are either pride or prayer. Either pride or prayer. You see, what had happened is sometime while Nehemiah was gone, the people decided they were going to do things in their own way. They ignored the Sabbath, and they kept working. Pride. You can read back studies from the 1960s. You know what they said? By the year 2000, that Americans would only be working 20 hours a week. Did you know that? There'd be so many technological advances. Americans would be only working 20 hours a week. Now, they're saying the basic American works about 50 hours a week. America and Japan are the two countries that work the most, right? There's supposed to be so much technology, we wouldn't be doing any of that. <clears throat> and yet, we see the same thing here. They're supposed to rest on the Sabbath, be reminded of God, focus on Him, and instead they are working and trying to make an extra buck. They intermarry, and we see their kids don't speak Hebrew, Right? The issue with this, how are they going to learn these scriptures if they can't hear it, read it, understand it? They have Tobiah move into the temple, a pagan, into a, a room that's meant to store the offerings of God. Could you imagine if I said, hey guys, just so you know, the chapel, my cousin, Jeff, he's a really nice guy, my cousin Jeff, he's a Mormon, and so he's going to start having some services in, in, the te- in, in the chapel. Hope that's okay with everybody. I mean, he's related to me, so we're just going to go ahead and let it slide that he doesn't believe anything that we believe, right? And we're going to give him a spot at our church. That's exactly what happens here. The priest has family that's intermarried with pagans, and so he decides, hey, I'm going to give this guy the storeroom, the room meant for the offerings for God. We're going to let a pagan move in and live there lavishly. Instead of turning to God in their pride, the Israelites decide to do what is right in their own eyes. It's the same cycle we see over and over again in the Old Testament. In fact, that exact wording comes from the book of Judges, right? People decide to do what is right in their own eyes. So just ask yourself a question. Are we going to trust worldly wisdom or are we going to trust God? Are we going to trust worldly wisdom or are we going to trust God? When something happens in our world, what is our response? Is it to turn on the news or is it to get on our knees? Is it to seek wisdom from quote unquote experts in the world or is it to look to God first? We know God has given us common grace, and we're so thankful for advances in technology and science. But when we start trusting those gifts that God has given us over the giver, there's a major issue. And I believe what we see time and time again in the book of Nehemiah is you can either be a prideful person or you can be a praying person. But there's not room for both. I think it's really important to note as we study Nehemiah 
that this book both begins and ends with prayer. It begins and it ends with prayer. There's one thing that we want to learn from Nehemiah. So many times you hear people say, Nehemiah was this great leader. There's so many good leadership principles. And I think that is true. Nehemiah was an incredible leader. But I believe one of the greatest things that we can get out of the book of Nehemiah is the fact that we need to be people of prayer. I love that our church, I think, has responded well to this pandemic with our mobile food bank, feeding hundreds of people, hosting blood drives, being there for our community when it's hurting. I've been so thankful for the generosity of so many members that said, let me give to the benevolence ministry of our church so we can help those that are hurting. I'm so thankful for the way that our church has reacted. But I will argue that the most important thing that we have done during this pandemic is to have our weekly prayer times, our, I mean, our weeknight prayer times, daily going to the Lord and seeking His face and readily admitting that we are dependent on Him. I think it's no mistake that Nehemiah begins and ends with prayer. Because ultimately, I think what we see with the book of Nehemiah is what Nehemiah is doing is it's not a book about leadership principles. What this book is really doing is Nehemiah is pointing us to Christ. It's pointing us to Christ. I think there's actually beauty in this really anticlimactic ending. I think there's a lot of beauty in it. Because what it does is it puts us on a trajectory towards Jesus. What Nehemiah does is it reminds us what we actually need. Nehemiah reminds us what we actually need. When you start reading Nehemiah, you get this idea that what the people needed was a new economy or new government officials. It was new walls. It was a rebuilt city. But then what Nehemiah shows us is that even with a fresh start, we need something more. We need new hearts. So it's not safety that we need. It's not a better economy that we need. It's not a better government that we need. Nehemiah shows us very simply that we need Jesus. We need Jesus. Nehemiah and the Israelites, they got this incredible fresh start. 52 days, the walls are rebuilt. People move back in this incredible dedication. And then just one, maybe a few years after this, Jerusalem is back in shambles. We don't need a fresh start. We need new hearts. True restoration comes only through Christ. Sin has corrupted us completely. Our world is broken, isn't it? And we could talk about, initially in all my notes, I'm talking about how this COVID crisis has just brought our country to a standstill. And then now, just these past few days, we've seen horrible injustice with the death of George Floyd. And now we've also seen this reaction with riots and destruction. With all these advances that we've had, we can see how sin still rears its ugly head, doesn't it? And I think what we are reminded of is that we are not the answer. We're never going to be able to get it right. We cannot fix ourselves. If we just ended with Nehemiah, one of the last books of the Old Testament, if we didn't have any other New Testament, we could all walk out of here really, really depressed this morning. 
lamenting with this understanding that we can't fix ourselves, that there's no hope. Our pride gets in the way. In our own strength, in our own power, we will only mess up. And if all we had was the Old Testament, man, it'd be tough, wouldn't it? But I think what Nehemiah does is it points us to Jesus. It points us to our need not to try to fix ourselves, but to turn ourselves over to completely to the Lord, to surrender to Him, to say, God, I know that my heart is evil because of sin. I know that it is wicked, and I need you to take that heart and give me a new one, to take my heart of stone and give me a heart of flesh, as it says in Ezekiel or in Jeremiah. Nehemiah prays, and what does he pray? He says, God, remember me. God, I'm trying to live for you. God, I need you. God, remember me. And here's the good news. Through the blood of Jesus shed on the cross for you and for me, God will remember us. If we simply turn to him and say, God, I can't do this on my own. God, I can't fix myself. God, I know that I am a sinner. I know I can't save myself. God, I need you. God loved us enough to send his son to die on the cross for our sins. And if we pray, repent of our sins, turn to him, the Bible says that God will give us a new heart, a regenerate heart, so that we might be able to follow him. Through Jesus, God will remember us. Just like through Jesus, God remembered Nehemiah. So we can lament this morning because the world is broken. We see, we've seen a lot of evidence of the brokenness of the world in 2020, haven't we? But in the midst of our lamenting, we lift our eyes up. And we focus on Jesus. We realize that help and healing and hope can't come from anything we do in our own strength, in our own might, that we're powerless, but God is incredibly powerful, and He can save us, He can restore us, and ultimately, He will make all things new. The city that Nehemiah and the Israelites failed to rebuild completely, we know that when Christ returns, He's going to build a new city a perfect city. We know that Christ is going to wipe away every tear from every eye. And there's going to be no more injustice. No more abuse of power. There's going to be no more disease and pandemics. There will only be perfection with him. Nehemiah reminds us to long for that day. The world around us reminds us to long for that day. So it's my prayer for any of you that are watching right now, if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, pray exactly what Nehemiah prayed. Remember me, my God, with favor. And we know that God can remember us with favor because of what Jesus did on the cross for our sins. So I'd implore you to turn to him to repent, confess your need of a Savior. And church, let Nehemiah be a reminder to us that we need to be completely and utterly dependent on God every single day, that we need to let the Spirit guide us. If we try to do anything in our own strength, it will fail, and it will fail miserably. But we confess that we are weak, we'll understand that God's grace is sufficient for us. When we are weak, He is strong. So instead of pride, trying to do things our own way, church, let us be a people of prayer that are seeking God and looking to Him and finding hope and healing and restoration through Jesus. Nehemiah reminds us we need more than a fresh start. We need 
Jesus. Let's go to Lord in prayer this morning. God, we love you. God, we're so thankful because of your son, Jesus, that we can approach your throne of grace with confidence. Lord, I pray right now if there's anyone or who's watching this service right now, who's never made a decision to follow you, God, I pray that right now your spirit would be working on their heart, or that you would draw them to yourself. God, we've been reminded of how broken our world is. Lord, if we see how we so mirror Jerusalem in so many ways, with an inability to get out of our own way. So God, I pray that we'd put aside our pride. God, that we would be people of prayer that look to you, that depend on you, that put our trust and our hope in you. So God, we repent. But of us trying to do things in our own strength, in our own might, in our own power, And God, we approach your throne of grace, asking you, Lord, to speak to us, asking your spirit to lead us and to guide us. God, we pray that you'd use us in the days ahead. You'd use us to make your name famous. God, you'd use us to share the truth about the hope and healing that we have through Jesus. God, we know it's not about us, it's about him. God, we pray that we would make much of Jesus. In your son's name we pray. Amen.